The only Christmas tree worth having this year is the Tree of Evolutionary Life, now in its limited edition winter form. Grab this limited time poster now while you can, it depicts every single Pokemon and how they'll be related to each other, including the all new Mel Metal. Using the links below, grab one for yourself or for a friend. Hey, Pokemon Masters, Bokey Batobi here, and welcome to my laboratory. Laboratory, it's a place where I study Pokemon evolution, and actually Pokemon forms. Many of you will be familiar with my Tree of Life, now available in Christmas edition. This is a tree of Pokemon evolution, showing how every single Pokemon connects. But there's a few things missing from the tree. For example, how does Mega Evolution work? How do Shiny Pokemon work? What about all the different forms? Are they different creatures? Sometimes a Pokemon's form changes quite drastically. Would it move where it's placed on the tree? Consider this a bonus episode, and in fact, the Tree of Evolution, the Christmas edition that's exclusive only until the 31st of December, when it's gone, it's gone forever, and it's just the regular version. But this version has actually changed the forms of over 50 Pokemon. Any Pokemon that could Mega Evolve has now Mega Evolved. Any Pokemon that has a form variant that's more winter-themed, we've gone for that. But even if the Pokemon doesn't move places on the tree, I want to cover everything. Shiny Pokemon, gender variants, and Pokemon forms. How, would the, how do they all work, at least? This is a bonus episode, and we're starting off with shiny Pokemon. So, shiny Pokemon, or color different Pokemon. They weren't originally called shiny or shining Pokemon, they were just color variations. And in our world, there is variation in the color of our skin, and our eyes, and our hair. These to do with pigments, and specifically something called melanin. Melanin is a very useful evolutionary adaptation. The darker skinned you are, the more protected you are against sun damage. The lighter skinned you are, the less melanin you have, and the less protected against skin damage you have. You might be more likely to have freckles. Freckles are, in fact, little concentrated areas of melanin in the skin, protecting those individuals against sun damage. We also have variations in the colors of our eyes, in the color of our hair. You might be familiar with albinoism, people with very light skin. That occurs because the people don't have much melanin or just can't produce it. Those people are incredibly sensitive to the sun. So we can see how pigmentation is probably the key uh, link in the real world that could explain how shiny Pokemon happen. It covers almost every shiny Pokemon, in fact. Of the course, though, the, the colorations of shiny Pokemon are usually far more radical than what you would find here on Earth. That said, before we get into the rest of the different kinds of forms, I want to address a few specific Pokemon where the lore of the Pokemon might help explain its specific shiny form. For example, let's start with Clawitzer, because this does have a real world comparison. Clawitzer regularly is blue, but it's shiny as a bright red lobster color. And interestingly enough, in the real world, this is the closest example that we have to this happening. But about one in two million lobsters do just, for some reason, are this incredible blue color. Again, it's a pigmentation thing. We find out through Pokemon lore that the reason that the red Gyarados is red is because Team Rocket were using radio waves to force evolve Magikarp. And red Gyarados is red because it still has Magikarp's red orangey coloration. Again, this kind of implies a genetic aspect to it, that the, the forcing of evolution somehow messes with the genetic code of the Pokemon, and so the pigments change. This is actually very similar to the Pokemon that appeared in the Pokemon card game under the Delta species Pokemon. There are a lot of shiny Pokemon or shining Pokemon in this set. And the Delta species Pokemon, for those of you who don't know, are Pokemon cards that are the di that are different types of what they would normally be. And the lore explaining this is that there's this team looking for Mew and they used radio waves, much like Team Rocket did with the Red Gyarados. They used these radio waves and it affected all the Pokemon on the island, changing their types, changing the genetic structure, turning them into the Delta species Pokemon. Something interesting and not really explained by anything is just that the Jigglypuff line and Clefairy line, they're shinies, they just show a relationship between these two Pokemon, which I've talked about in previous episodes. Nido King's shiny is the same regular coloration as Nido Queen, and there is a theory suggesting that Nido Queen might actually be a clone of Nido King, which suggests why it can't breed and why it is a different kind of gender variant. As is the case for all rock, steel, and ice Pokemon, they may be made up of different materials, different minerals. You can very clearly see this in Gigalith. Gigalith is probably one of my favorite shiny Pokemon, clearly with different different stones in it than the regular Gigalith, so that could explain pretty much any uh, shiny variant of, of a steel, ice, or rock Pokemon. Maybe for ice Pokemon, there's something funky in the water that is frozen. For Voltorb and Electrode, which are clearly theorized to be a possessed Pokeball, um, it could be a possessed Great Ball. It could be that simple. And actually, with the case of all man-made Pokemon, it could be a result of different programming. I'm looking at you, Paragon. Slugma and Makago are an interesting one, because there's a lot of Pokedex entries talking about how hot Makago would be, but if it was truly that hot, it would would actually be more of a purple color. And wouldn't you know it, Shiny Macargo is that kind of color. So maybe Shiny Macargos are the ones that burn the hottest. While the Shiny Slugma maybe aren't burning so hot and are, are just turning into ma uh, like molten magma rock. Shiny Sharpedo helps show its relationship to Shiny Mega Garchomp. The regular Shiny Garchomp doesn't have any variation here nearly whatsoever. 
But the Mega Garchomp, you can see that there is a connection between between the Garchomp and Sharpedo lines. That has been theorized about in previous episodes. You also get the exact same thing with Fennekin and Ninetales, which are almost absolutely related given their relationships to wizardry and witches and sorcery and also both being fire foxes. Minior, with Minior, there is a theory that it comes possibly at, at, not out of Ultra Wormholes, but it has some kind of relationship to them, given that it only falls over the Alola region where the Ultra Wormholes show up and you've no, you may have noticed Noticed that shiny Minior kind of shares a similar pattern to how Luzamine looks when it, it's absorbed by Nihiligo and many of the elements of the Ultra Wormhole worlds, many of the Ultra Spaces, so perhaps there's a connection there, it's like a special one, maybe it has fallen through or gone in the pathway of an Ultra Wormhole to become shiny. There's also in the show, it's not actually a shiny Pokemon in the game, but there is a Golden Pseudo Wudo, and for that I have near to no explanation other than again, maybe it's a Radio Wave situation. Okay, moving away from shiny Pokemon, we now have gender variants, now I'm not going to go through and talk about every single gender variant. Area. My good buddy Noggin has already done a full video on that. Instead, I'm just going to talk a little bit about sexual dimorphism. This is a real phenomenon that occurs in, in, in our world. This is a thing where in the animal kingdom, sometimes the males take on a specific role, the females take on a specific role. For example, the lionesses, they hunt in packs. The lions, they tend to be like, like the king of the pride kind of situation. They look different. Male lions have manes. They are maybe for show, maybe to attract mates. And that is actually what a lot of sexual dimorphism comes down to. A lot of the Pokemon, it, it tends to skew in favor of the males having bigger tusks, bigger horns, bigger fangs, teeth, claws, kinds of things for fighting, or having bigger manes, or funkier patterns, or prettier, pretty feathers. Uh, these things are all designed to attract mates. And usually that, that, that's pretty much the whole Pokemon um, gender difference thing. If you want to see the full video explaining all the science behind every single one, again, I recommend Noggin's video. As I've already explained with Nidoking and Nidoqueen, there might be a slight difference there because there's a theory that Nidoqueen is cloned by from Nidoking, that the whole species is as the result of a, a, a pre-Mewtwo cloning experiment with Nidoking. And now I'm just going to do the long one. I'm going to run down all the different forms of Pokemon and explain why they're different. For example, the Oxus is just unstable DNA, which is why it can transform into so many different shapes. Burmy and Wormadam kind of live in symbiosis with their environments when they wrap up in the cloaks of the various things that are, are around them. Rotom's forms are based on appliances, so they certainly wouldn't be different on the evolutionary tree. Giratina is particularly interesting. It's one of my favorites. Its body is radically different depending on whether it's in the distortion world or in our world. Potentially because the laws of physics are different in the world where it usually lives, and because it's a god-level Pokemon, it just changes its form to be more appropriate to the, the, the laws of physics in our world. There's a spiky-haired Pichu that showed up in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, that's probably just a genetic difference. Or potentially just a different hairstyle, like Richie's Pikachu, or any of the Pikachus or Eevees showing up in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. And by the way, the Pikachu forms, are they're, they're just Pikachu wearing different clothes. This does not go somewhere different on the evolutionary tree of life. Basculin's two forms are pretty interesting because the red stripe and the blue stripe don't get on. They fight each other quite frequently. Potentially, this is a species of Pokemon beginning to separate into two separate species. And because they e eat a lot of each other, they maybe e e are involved in cannibalism. These stripes allow them to identify the ones that aren't related to them while, while not attacking the ones that are closer related. Darmanitan in Zen mode is just meditating, so that's a thing. Then there's a couple of plant-based ones like Gorgeist, like uh, Sawsbuck and Deerling, or even like Cherim. And that's usually based on it is the are the plants that are attached to these creatures are they getting enough nutrition what time of year is it perhaps a gorgeist that's absorbing more nutrients would be bigger and, and that explains why it can be the form that it is there's also landris tornadoes and thunderous that have their Therian forms that exist in the dream world it could very much be the exact same case as giratina where the laws of physics are different in the dream world and so being like these legendary pokemon they just change their form to make it more comfortable to exist in this version of reality instead of in the dream world curim is Zygarde and Necrozma are all pretty much in the same boat. They were once complete Pokemon that have been separated into their various versions, and that's why you have a complete form, that's why you have versions that are separated. And the Unknown's different forms are all sort of, well, they're just, they're just different shapes, I guess. I don't know if there's any function to it, although there is a theory that they represent the coding of the Pokemon video games, and because we use that alphabet to code the games, or actually, do we? Do we use the Japanese alphabet? I wouldn't know enough about game coding. But the point is, that's why they have all the different forms that they have. Cast forms, of course, is simply reacting to the weather. Keldios may well be a sign of maturity and power. Meloetta uses its own psychic powers to change its form. So again, it doesn't change anywhere on the evolutionary tree. Actually, a lot of the forms don't really. Ash Greninja is a very special case and is almost definitely not genetic. Unless it's somehow taking on Ash Ketchum's genes to look the way that it looks. That would be weird. Hooper is a pretty magical creature 
so no explanations as to its form change on the evolutionary tree. Or a choreo though, that is an interesting one. It seems to change its form based on the kind of thing that it's eating. And that's similar to the pink and island Pokemon from the anime. And there's not only pink Pokemon on that island too, there's a pink Butterfree, there's a pink Kecleon. So potentially these Pokemon are all changing color based on the things they're eating. Actually, it might also be the case for the east and west versions of Shalos and Gastrodon. Depending on the food, either side of the region, maybe it changes its form based on, on its diet. And this kind of thing, an animal changing the way it looks based on the food that it's eating, this happens in the real world with the frill dragon or the blue-footed boobies. <laughs> These animals have different colorations depending on what they eat. In fact, sea slugs do this as well, and that makes total sense as to why it would be the same for Shalos and Gastrodon. Now next up, there's Vivalon, which has 28 different patterns, and I guess these are patterns that it's evolved depending on what's either intimidating or what will attract a mate, depending on the region of the world it's in. There's Aegislash, whose form changes, it, I mean, it's just turning from a sword to moving the shield in front, it's not really a real form but I do want to cover all of my bases. There's uh, Flabebe and its evolutionary lines. Of course, they are uh, different depending on the flowers that they are, and this can particularly be seen with AZ's Floet. Furfrau is based on a haircut, so again, definitely not a genetic thing. Oh, and the Alolan Pokemon Lycanroc, this is an interesting one. It likely has a different form depending on the environment it's in. Midday Lycanroc wants to blend in with the environments of Alola with the vast Pony Canyon. The Midnight one takes on a darker look so it can camouflage itself better. The Dusk one does the exact same thing. When there's an orange sky up above, it can hunt prey and avoid predators by blending in with the environment. There's a few more. The next up being Arceus, which is different forms depending on the plate it's holding. These change the color of it, its outer ring. And you know, that's kind of magical god level stuff so I, I can't really deal with a lot of that stuff. Sil Valley is the same thing, just reverse engineered. The RKS system that has been developed, perhaps part of the development was just assigning a different color depending on the type of Sil Valley. Megina is the same deal, it was man-made and originally it had a different kind of coloration to it. That perhaps rusted away and created the Megina that we look at today. Both were the cases of Mimikyu and Mars Shadow, they aren't really form changes, they're just in battle kind of things that happen that don't really change the look of the Pokemon at all. Wishy Washy's form change of course is a schooling tactic, so it's not actually, it, it did not even, uh, the large wishy-washy is not one Pokemon. It is a school of lots of Pokemon. Back to Minior, it's gonna be based on the different minerals and gases that, com that compose the Minior core. That's why it's gonna have all those different colors. And now we move on to our last interesting ones, including the totem Pokemon and size differences, like what you see in Let's Go with the large Pokemon and the small Pokemon. Totem Pokemon are generally bigger. That's just gonna be based on what they eat, really. How much of it do they eat? We also have some interesting Pokemon in the show. There's the clone Pokemon in the first movie that have been genetically enhanced, and so as a result of their genetics changing, they have these different patterns on them. On Valencia Island, there are Pokemon with variations. These are just like the Alolan forms, really, just are a lot more tamed down. And the Alolan forms, by the way, they were already on the evolutionary tree. There's an Executor with five heads, perhaps in places it's sunnier. That is a variant of Executor that exists. There are so many different Magikarp and Magikarp Jump, but when Magikarp is the most prevalent Pokemon on the planet, spanning absolutely everywhere, it's no wonder that there are that many different variations of it. Spinder is a really cool one because there's like billions or millions of forms of Spinder with different spot patterns everywhere. And that makes sense because when they are all in a group and it's a, a group behavior and they're all dancing around like this clumsily, if you're an attack Pokemon and you see lots of spinders together, all of these red flashing dots moving about as one big mass movement, it would be terrifying. So it's a defense mechanic. Another Pokemon variant can be seen in the Shadow Pokemon. They appear in all sorts of media, such as the card games as the Dark Pokemon or the TV show. You can see Team Rocket using Rage Crowns to make their Pokemon stronger, or in the film, Team Rocket using the Dark Ball to create stronger, darker looking Pokemon. And of course, in the side game, Pokemon Colosseum and Pokemon XD. And while Shadow Pokemon don't look very different, Apart from having a shadowy aura about them, some of them have gotten so dark that their forms have begun to twist and change. This can be seen a little bit in the Dark Celebi from the fourth movie, the Shadow Lugia, of course, from Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness, and Shadow Mewtwo from Pokemon Tournament. In terms of Mega Evolution, I'm not going to go through each one individually. All I'm going to say is that they were kind of, they were born out of war, the war of 3,000 years ago with AZ. And so all the Pokemon, they're in the same places on the evolutionary tree, but a lot of their traits, they've been adapted for, for more battle-specific purposes purposes, and you can see this in their Pokedex entries, uh, Mega Evolution is definitely an aggressive thing, and all of that was natural apart from Mewtwo, which was you know, probably a man-made Mega Evolution. The fact that Infinity Energy can change the way a Pokemon looks, as seen in Mega Evolution, could also explain why Xerneas has two different forms. The active mode while it's in battle, and the neutral mode while it's not. Perhaps in one, it's more charged up, and it is the Pokemon that can control Infinity Energy and the life force of Pokemon. Actually, Shaman's Grisadia Flower is kind of a similar thing. I don't really get why 
why it would change a hedgehog from a deer, and if this was a regular Pokemon, it would mean it would move all over the tree, but because it's a mythical, and I don't really have a proper placement for it and what its origins are, I'm not actually gonna be moving it anywhere, just know that the Grisadia flower just seems to turn it into its battle form. In the anime, there is also a Crystal Onyx, and any of you familiar with the channel will know that I already have a theory about this Pokemon, all Onyxes look like this. According to Onyx's Pokedex entry, it ingests mud and iron underground, and, and that is what gives it its rocky uh, outer layer. And then the iron eventually becomes its metal coating that evolves it into a Steelix under intense heat and pressure, but all Pokemon, all, all Onyx have this crystal-like core, and this can be seen in Mega Steelix, where you can see that crystal core poking back out. And finally, the really obscure, the really niche, we have the Break Mode from the Pokemon TCG. This is just a golden aura of Pokemon, but any of you familiar with the lore of the Pokemon cards, and yes, by the way, there is a law within the Pokemon card world. The Break Pokemon actually come from alternate dimensions, so in that dimension, maybe this is their form of shiny Pokemon. Maybe this is another variation on Mega Evolution or Z-Moves. Either way, these golden Pokemon, yeah, they come from another dimension. I do not have an explanation for that variation. There is also a Groudon that appears in the Jirachi movie that is very different to any other Groudon you may have seen. Uh, it was created likely from memory. And so it is not really a Pokemon, it is an imperfect form. Also in one of the movies, there is a Deoxys that has a different colored gemstone. Uh, likely, again, the, the, the comet that was traveling the mutated into Deoxys, it just, it was a different colored comet made up of different materials. And finally, there are the primal reversions, Groudon and Kyogre, which of course are Groudon and Kyogre using the energy of the world, the pure energy, infinity energy that's flowing in the world to have these more powerful forms, and potentially primal Dialga from the Mystery Dungeon series is exactly the same. Now, this has been a long bonus episode. There was, has been a lot to cover here, but there is at least one more bonus episode because there are some other Pokemon out there that aren't even really Pokemon, and I want to discuss those. Things like Slowbro's Shell, which is supposedly a shell that only shell that doesn't look like that. Or what about anime exclusive things? There is a lot of really obscure bit of Pokemon lore that I, that I do want to talk about with you. So of course, look out for that video as well as episodes covering any new Pokemon that are going to get announced over the next year. Don't forget you can get hold of an Evolutionary Tree of Life poster link at the top of the description. Of course, if you're getting seeing this video before the year is up, then there's a chance to get hold of the exclusive Christmas poster, which has lots of form changes, lots of bonuses. Let me know what you think about this video in the comments. And of course, so high Pokemon Masters. A massive shout out goes to my incredible patrons, many of who you can see the name of on screen now. Most of all, to the big patrons of the month, Yoni Sobin and Xavius. If you want to find out how you can support the channel, please check out the links to Patreon in the description below and get some of those sweet, sweet perks. Thank you.